Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 872. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 30th, 2024. All right, thank you for joining us for another program of Anglican Unscripted. This is, and I've said it before, our happy place. George and I spend the whole week perusing the uh, the social networks and the internet, looking for fun stories to, you know, entertain us, but also to entertain you. And I think we found a bunch this week that will help that out. Before we get too, too far into the episode, we've hit 10,000. Okay, it only took 50,000 years, but we have not, we have 10,000 subscribers. Many people have done it faster than we have, but we just did it our own slow way. And I want to thank you, uh, 10,000 people out there, for subscribing. Now, to be honest, only 62% of my audience is subscribed. Some of you, for some reason, uh, you think you're going to get automatic updates uh, just by hanging out there in the Internet, clicking refresh. You don't have to. You click the subscribe button and you will be instantly notified anytime there's a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. Please click the like button, share this with your friends, family, and foe, and go to the comment section once again. The comments were alive this week and you should have been there if you weren't. George, how are you doing this week? I've got good problems this week. Good problems. And that we have a missionary in our parish who uh, works in Hamburg with, in the red light district. Uh -huh. She's a She's been there 10 years. She's a young girl. Oh, she's now just turned 40. Uh, but that's still a baby for me. <laughs> okay. And uh, we periodically, we need to raise funds for her. So we're in the middle of fundraising for that ministry, which is really, really a wonderful life-changing ministry. I mean, mm -hmm. the work people do across the spectrum in the name of Jesus Christ is just wonderful. Like, I could no more do the work she does going into brothels and trying to you know, share the good news of Jesus Christ and help women escape from the mafia, the Russian mafia who run the brothels and everything. You know, this is a, this is a, a real tiger and it's yeah. a tiny little girl. Yeah. So we're doing fundraiser for that. And uh, another parishioner, my goddaughter, is getting out of prison in a few months and I'm starting to look for a car. So she can, uh, she's trained as a cosmetologist. Uh, so that she'll have a job when she gets out and now i just need to find her a car and just these are good problems to have yeah. because they're problems of expansion and growth and need and joy and new life and you know god, god is really blessing me you our country our 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 communities and sometimes we just have to look and see how good thing we have it compared to the rest of the world no, and that's true. One of the things we 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 pre, pre I don't preach it. You preach it. Is uh, transform lives. You know, this whole thing we do is to report on and show how the church is transforming or should be transforming. We point out when it fails to do that, uh, people's lives. That's the the whole mission of the gospel is to take the broken and fix them. And uh, you know. Sometimes our reporting can to show where that's not working very well, and uh, many times our reporting shows uh, in different parts of the, the world where uh, it's taking off. Uh, and so, fasten your seatbelts, I said last week. George, we got lots of different uh, stuff to talk about. Uh, uh, first and foremost is the and here I have to do ear quotes special ordinations that happened in the Church of England under the guise of a new alliance against the empire. Well, let's talk a little bit about what happened over there. Last Wednesday, July 24th, seven men from four different dioceses of the Church of England were commissioned. They were not ordained, but commissioned to serve as ministers. By And this was done led by Rod Thomas, the retired Bishop of Maidstone. And participating in the ceremony were Julian Henderson, the retired Bishop of Blackburn, John Dunnett, the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council, and this was at William Taylor's church. Now, before the service, Bishop Henderson said that those being commissioned had shown courage in making a stand against the direction of travel that the Church of England is taking at the moment 
by choosing not to be ordained by those who wish to change the church's teaching and practice about relationships and marriage. So these are ordinands, people who have been trained in Church of England theological colleges who do not want to have hands laid on them by their bishops, who may be LLF bishops in charge of it. So these people will be in, but not of, the Church of England, meaning, and uh, William Taylor said that these those commissioned for ministry will be teaching the scriptures regularly with the con within the congregation where they lead and will preside at informal church family meals at which bread is broken and the death of Lord Jesus is remembered. So oh, oh, this oh, oh, is oh, causing uh, a bit of a ruckus here. In my interpretation of the New Testament, is that not the Eucharist? Yes, they'll be presiding at the Eucharist, but it'll be informally. And they're not being ordained, they're being commissioned. And, and legally, they have the status of, say, youth minister, a lay minister within the Church of England, because they're not ordained, they're not clergy, according to the Church of England. But they will function as clergy in the diocese, in the parishes where they will be working. And they will be given sacramental responsibility. Now, it was said at the service that eventually these seven men will be ordained by a good bishop, a uh, serving bishop, but this is raising a lot of questions. Now, first off, we need to say one of the jabs at the conservatives in the Church of England is that all talk, no action. Well, they've acted. Yes. And, you know, we cannot, you cannot say that they're just sitting on their hands. How they've acted has caused a bit of concern by the left and the right. The left says, well, these people are schismatics. How are they going to be celebrating Holy Communion if they're not real clergy? And so on and so forth. And people on the right uh, are saying, well, why don't they just join the Anglican network in England? Or, and this is just for rich, this is a rich man's answer. Because these are churches that can hire these fellows as assistants and not need any money from the diocese to pay their stipends. So this is not a solution for the vast majority of the Church of England where one fellow has got to take care of six or seven congregations in the countryside. This is for wealthy city churches or suburban churches that have assistants who don't need money from the national church or the diocese. So there's a, I don't want to call it carping, but there's criticism on both sides for what uh, the CEEC has done, but I need to congratulate them on having done something. Something, yeah. I mean, I, there wasn't even a lot of talk of doing something for a long time. There was, you know, something has to be done. Um, I don't know if this was planned in the background uh, recently, just because of LLF. Um, but yes, uh, the the English Church of England has finally done something in a very gentlemanly fashion. I, I, I'm not sure sometimes how the English ever colonized other countries, uh, or, <laughs> but here we have something that uh, is very, not progressive, but this would be English aggressive. Well, remember, Kevin, a few weeks ago when the Alliance first came out and made its plant calls, one of the things you and I talked about was that until they start... Uh, doing ordinations and confirmations, Church of England will take no notice. Right. In other, and now they listen to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's rather uh, hubristic on our part, yes, but they're moving in that direction. Yeah. They are doing ordinations, and right. then we may see s confirmations by the Alliance's uh, seven retired bishops out of the 20 uh, overseers they've commissioned. So these things are happening. And it's here's happening. the funny thing. Don't I've contacted the Diocese of London mm -hmm. for a comment. No answer. Not as not and to me or to anybody else in the national church has not said anything. The response has been to ignore it. Which may or may not work. But like compare this to the Episcopal Church versus alliances within in that church uh twenty years ago. Um Eventually, the conservatives had to form their own um, jurisdiction. 
is just something that we're going to see down the line as well in the Church of England. Um, because mm -hmm. the, the, the Church of England uh, leadership has shown, if nothing, a great patience for slowly moving into the direction of uh, full progressiveness. And um, I, I'm just wondering if there's a, a way to compare that to what happened here in America. It's very hard because in America, dioceses are usually more monochrome in their outlook. So the Fort Worth, 99 and 9 tenths of the clergy uh, were Anglo-Catholics. Absolutely. Good. Uh, Central, Central Florida, we may be some Anglo-Catholics, some evangelicals, but we're 99 and 9 tenths conservative, where we don't uh, buy the things. And so a bishop has an easier job. But if you're, say, in an English diocese, you may be at a conservative bishop, but you will have liberals and conservatives in your congregations. So the degree of who you staff your churches with uh, is very different. Mm -hmm. Now, it is changing because in the United States, there are many dioceses that they're desperate for clergy. And so they'll basically take anybody they can get and stick them out in, in Omaha or someplace because they need a body out there. Um, and so you will see more, uh, and, and the old established dioceses, like I came out of Pennsylvania or New York, have liberals and conservatives because they're so big. But uh, that's, that's been changing. And after 25 years of bishops only ordaining people like them, uh, we've reached this situation in the United States. So other people like me had to move mm -hmm. from a cons liberal diocese to a conservative diocese or the conservative diocese and liberal diocese only ordain like-minded clergy. Yeah, I've seen a little turn in the Episcopal Church, whereas they don't have as many extremely liberal progressive clergy as they had five or ten years ago. At, well, they closed down all the seminaries, so that doesn't help. Uh, and they, and well, now they're they, kind of stuck with this a moderate or conservative is all they can choose. Well, there was an interesting little story in the Living Church magazine and the story was that had three former Episcopal clergy who were advocates for polyamory, and they were in polyamorous relationships. And, I, and that is uh, where you on, basically... Hold on. Yeah, we're with Christians here. They may not know what that means. Please, please tell us what polyamorous means. Open marriages, so there's yeah. more than, you know, maybe two men, three women, you know. It's well, not... Polygamy, and it's not but, male and female as God intended. Correct. Yes. And these three clergy, all from very liberal dioceses, got bounced out for advocating uh, polyamory. Um, now, someone would say, well, what took so long for the bishop to get rid of these people? Mm -hmm. And somebody pointed out that one of the one of the women clergy who was bounced out had been talking about the fact that she was a witch on Facebook. Well, uh, that didn't get her kicked out. <laughs> it was the polyamory. <laughs> but, he, but, he, but, he, but here's the thing. You know, there are some lines that the modern liberals will not cross. And I think polyamory is one of them. That's not going to happen, at least in my ministry lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, but I had a classmate in seminary who was the rector of All Saints in Pasadena, which is a very big liberal parish, you know, one of their flagship parishes. Mm -hmm. And he unexpectedly resigned uh, earlier this month after he had been promoting polyamory as the latest thing. Now, he was the only member of my class who was really into Jack Spong. And at the time, I thought he was a God help us. Uh, and he never changed. But, you know, even in the Diocese of Los Angeles, they're smacking down on that. Hmm. Well, interesting. All right, so that covers what's happening with the alliance in the Church of England. Um, you know, it's not Bob Duncan's alliance. This is something that, you know, you're seeing a, a little bit more of this English gentleman's uh, agreement where we're not going to uh, tie and make the Church of England mad. And I'm not sure well, that's going to, you know... I, I'll push the analogy a tiny bit. Okay. Um, you know, the cons in politics, the Conservative Party was just castrated in England. 
They were just destroyed in the in the elections. And co- well, hold and on. Nigel, conservative, conservative in name only. You know, yeah. Okay. And, and and Nigel Farage and his Reform Party, you know, just did wonderfully well. Though it's not represented in their parliamentary seats, oh. the amount of votes they got was very very impressive. And are we now seeing the Farage? And I'm not talking about the man, but the movement. Yeah. Is that now happening within the Church of England? Because the old conservatives in the Church of England, where they like the Tory party, just, you know, really indistinguishable from the liberals. Um, And now the true revolutionaries are moving forward. Is this not just the alliance, but the Star Wars analogy, the rebel alliance uh, coming into its own right now? Let's see. Interesting times for the Church of England, indeed. On to our next story. And this is the biggest story of the week, other than Biden, Harris, Trump. If you're looking at a global story, we go over to the Olympics being held in Paris, and they had a wonderful uh, opening ceremony that includes some things that raised eyebrows. Now, the opening ceremony of the Olympics for the last 45, 50 years probably starting with Michael Jackson being dropped in by a spaceship in L.A., uh, has been something of a spectacular thing we need to do. We need to draw the audience in, not just for all these games that happen, but we want to draw them in at an opening ceremony where where we uh, highlight our country and the city that's hosting it. Uh, England had a wonderful opening ceremony. Uh, uh, Japan did. I mean, there's a lot of money and time and effort put into it. Uh, so 19, I, 19, yeah. 1936, the Nazis had a wonderful opening ceremony in Berlin, you know? Yeah. Uh. So, I mean, you want to highlight your country and, and get people interested, and you want people to talk about the opening ceremony for weeks, months, years to always. You remember Japan? Yeah, that was just a great opening ceremony. So, that has been achieved. People are talking about the opening ceremony that happened in Paris, uh, but not for all the correct e- reasons. George, it had some religious significance that is going to take a little bit of apologizing to make up for. Well, it was as, as in your face a political statement as was the 1936 games with Adolf Hitler yep. and Lena Riefenstahl, who organized the spectacle. Yes, it was. Uh, the Olympiad. Olympiad opened with a 85 boats going down the Seine River, each boat carrying a uh, uh, the, the athletes of each country. Mm-hmm. And then it moved to some various tableaus, which are sort of human stage type things. And it, it enters mix between heavy metal music and classical music and lights. And, it, and in Jill Biden's words, it was spectacular, wow. wonderful. Wow. And it sort of had hints that there were things going on here in the background. We had the golden calf. We had the white horse from the Book of Revelation. And then we sort of culminated in a a Last Supper tableau, a parody. But instead of Jesus and his disciples, we had a scene depicting a a group of drag queens, trans models, and a half-naked blue-painted man with a morbidly obese woman at the center surrounded by DJ equipment and dancers. And this Jesus is a self-described gay Jewish fat activist named Barbara Bunch. Now the sort of highbrow Christian types, the uh, Christianity Today types and uh, so forth, saying, oh, 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 chill out, Christians. This is just uh, the Dionysian Greek Bacchanalia and the blue god was Dionysius. And just chill out. You know, you people are so ignorant. You know, Greece, Olympics, Greek gods. Well, well, Barbara Bunch. To, not to be fair, to to be fair, even uh, people who've not swallowed the woke pill, you know, went that way. Robert P. George from Princeton University, a prominent uh, uh, constitutional uh, teacher and uh, Roman Catholic, came on right away. Uh, you please, people, don't overreact to this. This morning he said, "Okay." You were right to overreact to it. He, he finally posted on his Facebook page that uh, I've seen enough, read enough, and most of the most of the characters in the production admit it was to to mock Christianity. So that, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Barbara Bunch said this was a a uh, gay Last Supper, 
Mm -hmm. uh, the artistic director said it was a deliberate uh, parody because he wanted to be inclusive by denigrating Christianity. Yeah. I don't get that. Don't... And then the, the official program of this for you for the tourists out there watching the thing called it a Last Supper in French. In French. <laughs> so this has caused a great deal of anger. And in some ways, it's a Rorschach test for people because some people, you know, I, I'm looking, you know, Facebook and the internet and YouTube have these Catholic commentators saying this is a deliberate attack on Roman Catholicism. No. Well, no. could be. And, but in other words, people are reading into this things that already are supporting their own worldview, if you will. And that's nothing wrong with that. That's how our brains operate. We're, we're pattern recognition machines. If yeah. we see Catholics everywhere, we'll see Catholics in this. But for me, my pattern recognition machine was going between, is this satanic or is this silly? Is this a deliberate satanic evil or is this just some really stupid people with too much money? Um, and my answer is both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, stupid people do stupid things without being satanic, you know, and th this certainly crossed that field. Now, for me, as a Christian, I do not mind being mocked. Don't, you do it all day long. Um, d pff, you know, so when I watch this, were they mocking me? Yeah, of course. So, you yeah, know, big deal. You know, however, as in, in the cultural terms, is this French Revolution three? You know, they, they took out the Catholics in the French Revolution. They're going to uh, take out the rest of the Christians now. How enticing is this? And in reality, the uproar that has led them at all levels to offer apologies uh, for uh, stuff they weren't supposed to have done um, is amazing. They, they came out really quick. They completely removed the videos from the internet. They scrubbed it. Uh, there's a, uh, um, a, a French family who had their uh, living room they were recording as the, this was opening, and they were completely shocked uh, watching this. You could see this horrid faces on these French families going, what are they doing? This, is, this isn't us. We, this is not us. And true it is not you that's not the friend the, the france we know but it certainly was the the directors and the producers and the people in charge it was them and they enjoyed doing it now there are two voices that have been noticeably silent through all this hmm. on friday morning before the tableau was shown justin welby the archbishop of canterbury put out a tweet saying can't wait to see the opening ceremony oh i'm looking forward to it how wonderful uh -huh. And he's been busy tweeting all weekend on other stuff, but he has not said a word about this, hmm. nor has Francis. Pope Francis said a word about this. We've, it's been left up to the second tier. We had the Bishop of Worcester, John Inge. We had uh, the French Catholic Bishops Conference. We had the Archbishop of Pakistan, uh, Azad Marshall. We've had people around the globe. The Orthodox saying, Church. Look, the Orthodox yeah, saying, yeah. look, 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 this is just a step too far. This is just, it's not just bad taste, it's offensive. And you wouldn't do this to Muslims, you wouldn't do this to Buddha, Buddhists or anything like that. Yet, the people who really could make a difference in sort of speaking on behalf of large Christian groups, two of the two of the biggest ones are absent. Um, yet, Welby's had plenty of opportunity to tweet this weekend about other things that are on his mind. In other words, when, it, see, when I say this is satanic and silly, there's a battle for the cultural square. And by and large, we've lost that battle among the avant-garde. Yeah. And there is a very strong demonic satanic tinge to the avant-garde in Hollywood, in art circles, in Parisian cir art artistic circles and whatnot. And we need to have leaders who will push back. They need to push back with love, but they need to push back with firmness and say, you know, this is not, this is not right. 
and your celebration of the bizarre, the weird, the freakish, your celebration of nihilism is an attack on civilization itself. Okay. See, it's, it's not that the West is moving towards, it's not that we're all going to become Muslims one day or pagans one day. I think uh, there's a French uh, author, novelist named Michel Welbeck. Um, don't ask me to spell Welbeck. Uh, he, his, no, his novels all point to the same direction. We're moving into nihilism. We're moving from somethingness to nothingness. And what was celebrated on Friday night in Paris was the emptiness and nothingness. You know, sex means nothing anymore. Love means nothing anymore. And in other words, we've beauty means nothing anymore. We've lost all of those things and moved into the great. And in France on Friday night, they moved into the great void. They have. We've lost West Western culture. Western culture was the, the great of the philosophers, the great of the artists, the great of the, uh, uh, his, you know, just go through all the muses, uh, everything that was great. And we've lost that. We, we've finally identified the worst of us and have celebrated that and left that to identify the nation of France in, in lasting memory. And if I were a French citizen, I would be horrified and I would demand the president of uh, France, Macron, uh, apologize for it vocally. Uh, the my little to my little thinking about this is that you know the organizer is a proudly man who identifies himself as a French gay Jewish atheist. Let's all put that together. We did. We and, saw it. <laughs> and he may be all those things in his own mind, but he's really a Gnostic. What do I mean by that? He believes there's a higher knowledge that we get from providence of the creator that is only known to the adepts only those known with who have participated in these higher things and the great mass of people will never know the truths that he knows and this gnosticism uh is a work of the devil and it is we see its destructive work here you know, Adolf Hitler was a Gnostic. Um, an atheist. It's, yeah, and there's nothing new in the world. There's really nothing new in the world. And I, when I was comparing this to the Nazi orchestrated games in 1936, I'm not saying that they were exactly parallel, but the spirit behind each is identical. A destruction of Western civilization, a dethronement of Jesus Christ as God, and a worship of power and nothingness and a headlong rush into the void. Mm -hmm. So the world in large wakes up horrified the morning after the opening ceremony. And what a great chance for Pope Francis or Justin Welby or other Christian leaders around the world to speak up. Um, I'm interested to find out what Justin Welby did say in his tweets this week. Well, he had two things. He called for the release of a Palestinian Anglican who has been jailed by an Israeli military court. It, we don't know anything about this other than what her family is saying and the Diocese of Jerusalem is saying. So we need to basically, you know, in my Kairos prison ministry work for the last 10 years, I've never met a guilty man in prison. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> nobody, <amazing. laughs> nobody ever did it. Nope. So. And, you know, it's nice. He's, uh, you know, he's pressing for somebody on the team, so to speak. Sure. But he also, uh, but he didn't mention Paris, but he has time to put an extensive comment about this Palestinian Anglican woman. And he also denounced a knife attack on a people attending a Taylor Swift dance party in Southport, which is near Liverpool. And it's left, as of this morning, three children dead, seven wounded, and seven children wounded and two adults wounded in serious condition. And he offered prayers for those who were attacked and he decried violence, knife violence, but he omitted that it was a 17 year old Muslim uh, refugee. Well, stop, stop, now, the, stop, stop, stop. You've just told all of England the truth. I don't, or in Britain, uh, be careful with that knowledge. Uh, right now, there's no freedom of speech in uh, Britain. And with that knowledge, you can be arrested and 
uh, persecuted, prose- persecuted, yeah, or prosecuted, uh, depending on how you look at it. So I just want I want to warn people over there: be careful with that knowledge. The British press is not revealing the name or the background or anything about this fellow, but it is in the American press. Uh-huh. And I should just mention out of a side that, uh, you know, since 2000, there have been 90 and and the police are saying, oh, this is not a terrorist incident, not a terrorist incident. OK, uh, it's a mental health incident. All right. Um, uh, I'll slitting. go with that if we can follow the progression of mental health into, into terrorism. Mm. Yes. Slitting throats of Christians mm. is a mental health issue. Now, Friday was the eighth anniversary of the slitting of the throat of a Catholic priest in France by a Muslim man. On camera. And that was called on camera. And that was a mental health incident because he was crazy. Because only crazy people would do that or Muslim terrorists, yes. or people who believe that they are doing God's will. Now, since 2000, there have been 97 incidents that have been labeled as terroristic by police in Britain. Of those 94, the perpetrators of the 97 incidents were terror- were Muslims. Um, Britain refuses to name names and to address uh, the truth. But this past weekend, Tommy Robinson, who is a very controversial figure in British uh, life, he's been jailed half a dozen times, he was arrested after holding a rally in London that drew 50,000 plus people. We can quibble over the numbers, but there are a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And he was arrested on speech violations for inciting terrorism, calling for people to stand up for Britain. And, you know, he pointed out that, you know, uh, pe- young people can't afford homes. They can't do any of this because there's a tremendous housing crisis in Britain because housing is being given to refugees who are just coming ashore that, you know, they're giving food. It, the system isn't working. And Chami Robinson, in my opinion, was arrested for a speech crime. And Justin Welby is completely silent and the Church of England is completely silent about the attack on Britain that is being taken place by unfettered migration, whether it's legal or illegal. It's, you know, the Andrew Tate, who is a uh, notorious commentator, a, he actually converted to Islam, and one of the reasons why he said was because Christianity is so weak, they won't defend themselves. That's true. They won't stand up for what they believe. And uh, in some respects, Tate is right because Welby is not standing up for the people of Britain. He's not standing up for not only the native Britons, but those who seek to become who seek to become acculturated, who seek to immigrate and work within the British system, and you know, not seek to create little pockets of Pakistan or Bangladesh or Somalia within England. I know. I remember George Orwell in an interview said that uh, uh, London was airstrip one, one of the, the key components of his book, 1984. And uh, it's interesting to watch this slowly happen in places that you thought had, you know, advanced culturally into the Western direction. And somebody somewhere got in the idea that we can just open the borders and nothing will go wrong. It's a humanitarian effort. And we've watched all these nations uh, over in Europe do this uh, to their their absolute detriment and destruction. Uh, uh, Britain being one of them, you know. Up until recently, there was a big difference, though, between illegal immigration in the United States and illegal immigration in England. Um, When I was a hospice priest 20-odd years ago, I would go out to Indian Town. Indian Town is near Lake Okeechobee, and that's where these giant migrant worker camps were. tens of thousands of men living in basically not tent uh, cities, but yeah. bar- barracks, yeah. barracks who would go out and pick the food and this and Strawberries that. and oranges. Yes. Strawberries, tomato, the whole thing. And you know, when people would, when they were ill, they were dying. I would come visit them mm-hmm. and I would minister among them. And the great majority of these people were of a Christian background for the South Americans. And they wanted to achieve the American ideal. They um, 
And America welcomes people like that. They welcome people into the melting pot. What America is not, is not a mixed salad. Right. It's not where you have a little bunch of Mexicans here and Anglos there and Italians there. It's a melting pot where we become one people, one ideology as Americans. And working amongst immigrants, legal and Im illegal, in these camps, that really was the desire. It wasn't to, you know, they sent money back home to care for their families, but with the desire one day to bring them to the United States so that their families could prosper. What we're seeing in Europe and what we've recently seen, recently seen in the United States, are people who are coming to recreate the, the broken conditions and pathologies of their home countries in a new country, but receive welfare benefits. So they don't have to work. So they can have five wives and have the state pay for their housing and their food and their children and the education, and they don't show up to work. And the taxpayer has to pay for this. Yeah. Now, we see, I, I was watching interviews with uh, some uh, illegal immigrants from uh, South America in New York City, uh, one of these little backpack reporters would go around and interview them, and they said we were all promised jobs when we got here. We were promised that we'd be able to work in as a, uh, a bush boy washing dishes or sweeping, that I would come here and I'd have an income and that I would be able to pay taxes and that I'd be able to, to put into Social Security and that I could become uh, a, a productive member of your society. Uh, and there's just no jobs here. There's no jobs for me. And if I wanted a job, I have to fill out this paperwork and it takes about six months. Uh, after a month in New York City, I get kicked out. I can't live there anymore. And you know, these liberals who are making promises uh, south of the border to these people uh, to come here, we don't have that. We don't have the jobs to offer them. Now, we do have the, the benefits they can come and take, um, but they don't want just the, the people that were interviewed didn't want just the benefits. They did want to participate. There's many who come across the border who don't want to participate. They just want the welfare. Absolutely. But um, yeah. and, I got to provide some both, of them, both some of them. sides here. So, and some come here because uh, Venezuela last year reported a significant drop in violent crime. Mm -hmm. Now, crime statistics in the United States are, you can't trust them, you can't believe them because the FBI keeps redefining crimes yes. each year. So you, we, you can't compare them year to year anymore. The statistics are almost worthless. No, so only white, people can, only white people commit crimes in America. And if American statistics are worthless, Venezuelan statistics got to be worse. Mm -hmm. But there might be a little truth to that the Venezuelan government emptied its jails and sent them all up to the United States. Because that's what Castro did with the Mariel Boatlift people in, uh, in the late 70s. He emptied his prisons and psychiatric institutions and shipped them to uh, the United States. Don't know why we're not uh, doing that with our prisoners. Send them over to England. They're taking them left and right. Uh, you mentioned Venezuela. Uh, currently, if you're watching the news, they had an election. Um, the opposition party, the non-communist socialist party, won. Um, but uh, in true fashion, a communist locks the doors and says, No, I won. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> so uh, we're finding out exactly how bad Venezuela is. It's it, you know, It's a demagogue of what communism uh, makes people and makes a country. Uh, election was held. The, a lot, the Rebel Alliance won. So what, what, what's going to happen there? A little bit of background. Uh, well, first off, the uh, government has cheated and said, no, you didn't win, we won. About 20 years ago, Venezuela was the second wealthiest per capita nation in the hemisphere after the United States. It had a GDP per person four times greater than Japan 20, 25 years ago. It had excellent health care, excellent education system. Venezuela was the success story of South America. Then Cesar Chavez, uh, not Cesar Chavez, uh, his last name was Chavez. Uh, Chavez took over. And he pursued, yeah. he pursued a socialist path. And now Venezuela is the poorest or the second poorest. It's still better than Haiti. Uh, nation. The economy has collapsed. The middle class has been destroyed. Only the very wealthy or the very poor uh, are left. I have a number of Venezuelans in my congregation. Um, 
I was talking to Miriam, one of them, her husband, her, her son, he's still there and she's trying to get him out and bring him to the United States, but she wants to do it legally. Um, Miriam uh, says, you know, her son has a, a business, uh, appliance business, and every month the National Guard comes by and demands $2,000 uh, in bolivars in the U.S. equivalent, mm -hmm. just for the permission to keep in business. And you need to hire this guy's son and that guy's son. It's mafia democracy. Well, the election was held. And up until about midnight, it looked like the opposition won about 71% of the vote. So in other words, there are pictures of the official tally center in uh, Caracas where they're tabulating all the results from the provinces. And the opposition is winning every province. It's got 71% of the vote and there are pictures of it. You see the computer screens of the uh, vote counters. And then about midnight, things go dark and the police and thugs start closing down voting centers. And surprise, surprise, in the morning, the dictator won with 51% of the vote. And Dominion, there's this company called Dominion that was running the, ex running the election software and somehow or another, like two or three million votes appeared and no vote for Maduro, the dictator, and no votes appeared for the other fella, the other, the other fella running. And in the morning, the uh, dictator said, I won. Now, he, and then he ordered the arrest of the opposition opponent, and he ordered the army into the streets. And what's been happening, and it's is a developing situation, there are videos, YouTube videos, of soldiers and police taking off their uniforms and joining the protesters against uh, Maduro. Now, whether the tanks come out and they crush it like the Chinese did at Tiananmen Square, or whether it's like 1989 in uh, Poland and Russia, where uh, the communists fall, we don't know yet. But the Biden administration is a really tough position because Maduro did what the Republicans claim Biden did in 2020, <laughs> uh, midnight uh, shenanigans at voting boxes and whatnot. And of course, Venezuela has an Anglican diocese, that's Episcopal Church diocese and church leaders. So instead of talking about the fight for democracy, uh, Welby uh, is using his bully pulpit uh, to talk about mosquito nets and jailed Palestinian and all this and that, when he really could be doing so much more. But I guess at this point, he's such a spent force, who really cares? Well, he's that the- That's uh... a terrible thing for me to say. He's the love, beloved uh, Archbishop of Canterbury of Airstrip One. So, you know, whatever. Uh, so Venezuela is something you need to pray for. Uh, I don't know how it's going to end. Uh, I don't think anybody was surprised that the opposition force won. Uh, it was, a, like you said, a thriving uh, country. I saw an interview with a lady who illegally... Uh, immigrated here to America. She was a business owner down there, and she wanted to be a business owner up here, and she found out that doesn't work that way. So, yeah. Well, one of the the, the orthopedic, uh, I saw had my knees checked. I'm an old man, Kevin. I had to go to the knee doctor. Oh, no. His physician, his PA, his physician's assistant, uh, um, is a member of my congregation. He's a medical doctor from Venezuela, and he left, and... Uh, he could pass the license to be a physician's assistant, not an MD, but you know, the, all the educated class, if they can get out of Venezuela and they'll take jobs as physician assistants and they'll take, you know, nursing jobs if they're in the medical profession, even if they're doctors, just to escape the collapse of that society. Hmm. All right, let's move into some more talk. We're going back overseas. Bishop of uh, Gloucester calls Israel an apartheid state. She's not the first uh, bishop to call uh, Israel that, but uh, the Palestinian narrative does not seem to be lacking their ability to uh, get their word out through uh, Church of England bishops, George. Rachel Trewick is a bishop of Gloucester, and she was the first woman diocesan bishop of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And she visited South Africa. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, she visited Israel. Okay. And Saw, saw different things and came back and last week published on her uh, diocesan website her book report uh, for the start of the school year, what I did this summer. 
And she talked about, oh, how terrible it is in Israel, the poor suffering Palestinians, yak, yak, yak. And then she said, in the 90s, I went to South Africa and I saw what apartheid was like. And Israel's an apartheid state. Hmm. Well, that's factually untrue. Which part? It's factually untrue. <laughs> she the went to Israel. She, or she went is there. an apartheid state. Did she go oh, to I'm South sure Africa? I'm sure she went there. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'm sure she went to South Africa. But, Kevin. She went on the pro-Palestinian Kool-Aid tour, where you talk to the activists, you talk to the perpetually aggrieved, and you don't get a true sense of the state of the affairs there in Israel. You know, this has been debunked so many times uh, that it's not really a serious argument anymore that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, Israeli Arabs participate in the education system, the army. There's no discrimination discrimination against them whatsoever no. um on the same day her letter came out the hezbollah in uh lebanon fired rockets into northern israel and they landed on a schoolyard and killed nine druze children who were druze they're a shia minority who have totally integrated into israeli life as druze serve in the military they vote there is druze members of the knesset um Somebody needs to tell them that they live in an apartheid state where they have to live in separate places and can't vote and can't go to schools and can't do this and that. You know, it's just, I ask myself, is she stupid? Is she evil? Or is she brainwashed? And I, my answer is, I think she's may not be that bright, but she's definitely brainwashed because the poor woman, if she's fed a diet of the BBC and the Guardian and the narrative of the bien passant left, she will, of course, see Israel as an apartheid state. Just because she's been there doesn't mean she has eyes to see what's right in front of her. No, because let's all agree the Palestinians and the Palestinian state is a state where the Palestinians are absolutely uh, terrorized. But they're not terrorized by the uh, nation of Israel. They're terrorized by the uh, terrorists who have taken over mm -hmm. and rule Palestine uh, to take the, yeah. the to take the food, who take the money, who take the uh, the love that uh, the world gives Palestine in billions of dollars a year and, for themselves. And then to to protect Palestine, they hide their tanks and bombs under the schools and hospitals. Now, a lot of the information we get in the Anglican world is from the Anglican Diocese, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Historically, that's been a dirty diocese. Dirty in the sense of Church of South India dirty or Tanzania dirty, mm -hmm. um, where the bishops are corrupt. Um, uh, there's a new fellow. He may not be like his predecessors, but with the Diocese of Jerusalem, I verify before I trust. I'm not going to do a Ronald Reagan trust and verify. I'm going to verify and then trust. Because as a reporter, going back to the Janine massacres, uh, alleged Janine massacres of 20-odd uh, years ago, the Anglican diocese has uh, time and again proven to be false and parroting either the Hamas or the PLO or the Hezbollah narrative. Well, why would they do that, George? Because they live under the PLO. They live under Hamas. Palestinian Christians in Israel are growing, they're thriving. Palestinian Christians in the West Bank, in Bethlehem, in Gaza are getting out as fast as they can. So you have to take my experience is that you have, here's a story and it, and I can it's not libelous because it's been proved, you know, I've written about this extensively. There was one bishop uh, who was very anti-Israel, really would go to the UK, raise money, support the PLO, this and that. And then he got arrested by the Metropolitan Police for cottaging. And what is cottaging? That's trying to solicit sex in a men's public restroom with another man. Well, the uh, Anglican Consultative Council and George Carey took care of the charge. It got reported in the newspapers, but uh, the Mossad basically held this out over this bishop and said, look, if uh, you keep talking about how bad we are, 
we're going to uh, tell everybody that you're closet homosexual. And that, of course, would be death to him socially, politically, and maybe physically. Now, I'm not saying the Israelis are perfect, far from it. But it's, it's like calling, well, I know this is a political thing, it's like calling Donald Trump a Nazi. Whether you like him or not, the Nazi, you know, Nazi is not something that you call somebody uh, who you disagree with politically. A Nazi is somebody who advocates the mass murder of people. The genocide, uh, for absolutely. Their yeah. Genocide. Yeah. So, I don't know. So, what, let's, I don't know, well, Kevin. I mean, sometimes, sometimes when you see how the sausage is made, you get a bit discouraged. Sure. Uh, when you see how these people, you know, in other churches rise up through the ranks, through bribery, through corruption, and these are Christian churches. And it's not just the Episcopal Church and the Anglican churches. It's right. the Roman Catholic churches, other churches where, you know, on Saturday, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, was welcomed into the uh, great cathedral in Moscow by the Patriarch Kirill, and it was Putin's name day, St. Vladimir's day, and there was a whole service blessing Putin and his work and his leadership of Russia by the Russian Orthodox Church. And, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church is firmly in the pocket of the state right now. At least in the person of Carol and its bishops. Yeah. Oh, they're there for safety. You don't want to oppose Putin at this time because uh, even friendly Western journalists over there uh, end up in jail for some reason. It's uh, well, actually, I don't think we may we may have mentioned it. We may not. You're ten times more likely to be arrested in Britain, yeah, for speech crimes than you are in Russia. Sure, and persecuted, prosecuted. Uh, for some reason, uh, the UK has. Uh, uh, made Russia look like a safe place. Good job, guys. Good job. Let's move on to our final story, a not-so-safe place for Christians. Now, when I was a young entrepreneur um, starting my business, my credit wasn't that good. You know, I had to make decisions of what got paid at the end of the month, and, you know, just you know, those decisions did not make my credit shine. Now, uh, I'm happy to say that I have perfect credit because I have no bills, no debt and uh, come a long way. However, my credit is not uh, unified with my social status here in America. Yeah, I get the, the, the best cards with the best rates, but um, it has nothing to do with politics. In China, your credit has a lot to do with uh, um, your politics, and it's not credit cards, it's social credit. What have you done for the state lately? And uh, you pointed out a story where the, uh, the party got together and announced three goals for the coming years, and it don't look good for Christians. Yeah, and this is a story that I think I'm the only one pushing. So I may be totally wrong, and I'll get my head chopped off for being totally wrong about this. But the uh, Communist Party had its Congress, and Chairman Xi laid out the roadmap ahead, and he laid out three main goals, economic, uh, environmental, farm, environmental, uh, social policy and the third goal he listed was to return people to from the cities to the land he's they're going to reintroduce the policies that Mao Zedong had in the 60s of sending people from the cities back to collective farms and the point is that there's unemployment in the cities and there are people moving in to the cities from the countryside they need people to work on the collective farms and so this was announced in the speech and then afterwards there's uh, sort of comments and questions by lower ranking party officials that come out in the newspaper well who will be the people sent back to the countryside to work in collective farms will it be the people who just got off the bus from the farm mm -hmm. and part of the answer is yes plus those with so low social credit scores so what does that mean a Christian in China has a low social credit score because they're an enemy of this state. They believe in an alien religion. They put Jesus Christ above the Communist Party. So one way the party, I believe, will deal with the problems of the growing Christian church is to send them from their jobs as engineers, businessmen, entrepreneurs, back to the countryside to muck out the pig stalls and collective farms like they did in the 60s during the Cultural Revolution. Yeah. 
Would this break the Christian church? Well, it will break institutions, but I think the faith of Jesus Christ will remain. But friends, this is a bad omen, I believe. Bad omen, but it may also protect them by putting them away from city investigators. And uh, you, you put them out in the country, I think uh, it would, uh, in a way, provide some protection for Christian communities. I don't know. Well, Kevin, Chinese countries, in the United States country, is a nice place. Is it? Bloody it space, is. I've, I've seen land. it. It is, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's a desirable place. Ah. And I, have a, I, have a, I am in the Chinese equivalent of the you country. Are. Yes, but, I, but I'm not on, a, but not on a collective farm. Okay. In China, the countryside is very poor. Ah. schools, social amenities, basic foodstuffs. It's all, the cities are preferred in China's distribution networks. And if you're stuck in the country and you're not, and here's the thing, you can't leave the collective farm. Yeah, you're stuck in that without region. permission. Yeah. Yeah. You're stuck there. And so let's say you're a Christian engineer or a Christian, you have a professional job, a white collar job. You're helping, you're, working in one of the high tech you're working at tesla you're working at apple if you tick the box that you're a christian that puts you a suspect and the state has to send okay we need to send a million people back into the farm we've already got the list huh. and there you go you're telling me there's and no you, full-time you, 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 rv or christians in china no no <laughs> and it's and again you, you know you're not living in Hooterville, Florida. You're living in the back of beyond in China without plumbing, without eating, without electricity, without, you know, working in the pigsties. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 872 of Anglican Unscripted.